Anything else I should worry about before I start or just start? Okay, welcome back everybody. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys can hear my audio on, it sounds like the audio is going through. The HDMI cable seems to be intermittent, that's awesome. Okay everybody, so um, I brought some props today. Um, maybe I'll even try to uh, leave a little, I don't know if there's a room, if there's a class coming in right afterwards or not. Last time, last Thursday there wasn't, so we actually had a little time afterwards. Um, I don't know if there's, I think sometimes there's a seminar on Tuesdays at four. I don't know if it started yet this time of the year. Anyways, I'd love for you to come, up, come down and uh, be able to play with the, ro the, the, I brought like one of every robot hand I had in the lab and, and the KUKA we're going to talk a lot about. So maybe if there is a, if there's a bunch of people that come into the room at four and we have to get out, then I'll just sneak through this door and you guys could hang out with me there, but it's, it's not glamorous there, but uh, there is another door and we could, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so um, the, the goal of today is to, you know, start digging into the material. Most of the, most of the time this, this semester, we're actually going to talk about software, about AI, about algorithms, right? But just this one day, and maybe a little bit again when we talk about cameras and, and if we talk about some of the tactile sensors later, but mostly just today we're going to talk a bit about hardware. And... <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about mechanical design or, or other things, but what I'm going to talk about is the, the features of the hardware that we have to work with that are going to impact us, our algorithms, okay? So, so mostly I'll try to highlight the, the features that are going to affect the way you control your robots. Uh, so the, the high-level goal is first I want to tell you a bit about robot arms. It turns out the hardware matters, uh, the choices that you make when you pick a robot. And we've picked EWA for the class, uh, Matter. There's a bunch of things that are about, you know, that are properties of this robot that are not properties of all the robots, and, uh, and we'll lean into those a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk a bit about how do you simulate a robot like this, including some of the, you know, the level with which we're going to simulate the details of that uh, hardware. And then I'll talk a little bit about robot hands and about mobile manipulators uh, and the like, too. <clears throat> I have in my mind, you know, uh, this is kind of like you're, um, you're booting up into your robot class, right? It's kind of like you're, you know, you gotta outfit your mech. I got, you know, you get to pick your, uh, your different tools. Unfortunately, I picked for you and, and we have a, just one robot and one uh, hand, but, but that's kind of what I'm thinking of here is you're, we're tooling you up for the class. I'm gonna run a handful of notebooks during the lecture. All the demos that I'm putting together for class, I'm putting into the, uh, links right from the notebook. So if you are uh, reading the notes and, and you follow along with the, the deep note links, you should be able to run anything I run, okay? Almost always. Okay, so you may or may not know that, um, I mean, we've clearly had robotic arms for a long time. You've seen robotic arms doing things on factory floors. Uh, they've been helping us weld cars together for a long time, right? Uh, but the robot arms are changing. I don't know if you realize that. They're, it's like they're evolving, right? Something's happening. And, um, you know, the robots that we used to think about and we used to build, we still build, of course, there's many applications, are these relatively big, scary robots that are often, there's a cage between the human and, and the robot, right? Or they're, they're confined to a very particular sort of warehouse environment, and they're extremely good at what they're doing, but they're, they're really not designed to be along, around people. And one of the big trends in robot arms today is that they're trying to be more and more comfortable. Uh, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're talking about cobots these days. People, you know, people in robots cohabitating or working together uh, to, to get the job done. This is one in particular, that's the Rethink robot, and that's Rod Brooks, who's uh, one of our uh, emeritus faculty, who's a leader, the director of the lab for many, many years. And that was a big deal for him. He was really making a point when he posed for that photo, but I'm not afraid of, my, of the robot draping its arms over me because we've built a robot that's fundamentally safer to be around. Uh, and actually, you know, while this was originally targeting a, fa a very much a factory environment, uh, the, the idea behind the Rethink kind of robots was, was maybe a small, like a mom and pop own a bakery and they want to be able to program a, a robot or, you know, sort of a little bit closer to, to the humans. 
And of course, we're all dreaming of, of the robot that we can take home and, and will hug us a good night, right? Uh, and, and people are working on that, right? There's, a, there's, there's a active research on trying to build Baymax, you know, in various, various forms around. And we'll talk about it when it becomes relevant. So if, however, you go around to the various research labs working on manipulation these days, there's a pretty common cast of characters, right? So you'll, you'll see kind of, there's a handful of robots, maybe a handful more that, that are on this, this page, but you, you normally see sort of one of these uh, handful of robots. This is the Universal Robot series. You can see Universal Robot 3, which is a three kilogram payload. You can see a 15, you know, they can get big, but they all look about the same like that. Uh, Rethink had their, their Baxter was their official one, their first one, then they had a Sawyer, which was one arm. Kuka, you see here. Uh, Canova is a, is a, the Jacos are, are actually a great robot in particular because they are mobile. This one, as you can see, has got a pretty serious infrastructure that goes around it. I would not consider this a mobile arm. It's got a, you know, it took us uh, a freight elevator and a half uh, and, and some pushing and, and grunting to get it down here. Uh, you know, the, the Canova was built to be mounted to a, a wheelchair originally and is in, has been one of the more popular mobile manipulators. Uh, this is the AVB Yumi, the Franca Panda. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, the robots that you'll see in the research labs. And they have different properties. And uh, the biggest thing maybe that differentiates them is the way you control them typically falls into one or two uh, modes. We have position controlled robots, and then we have robots that have torque sensing and torque control. So, So we tried to learn a few lessons from last time. The screen was too uh, dim on the uh, on the video stream. Uh, we thought, oh, we'll just turn the lights down. That'll fix it. Turns out there's the big skylight is the, the offender, not the lights in the room. So we probably didn't fix it, and I apologize. There's, we posted on Piazza, though, hopefully the, the link to the slides if you want to follow along that way. Uh, I also thought I wrote too small last time, so I'm going to try to write comically big. Uh, you know. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so um, it makes sense that there's, uh, you know, sort of the words make perfect sense. I could command my robots by sending position commands. When I say a position in terms, in the um, sense of a, of a robotic arm, I'm actually sending uh, the positions are the joint angles of the robot. So, right, I could command saying go to this joint angle, go to this joint angle, follow this time series of joint angles. You know, these are the ways you talk to a position controlled robot. That is very different than saying, I, wanna, I want you to like, apply these forces or these torques at the joints, okay? And <clears throat> in order to do torque control, uh, you have to have a certain type of robot. And in fact, if you, if you care very much about torque control and torque sensing, that, that sort of quickly uh, reduces the field of robots that are, are, are viable for you. And only a few of these are actually torque sensing and torque controlled robots. Uh, and I wonder if you know why that is. Like, why is it that so many robots are position controlled, right? How, how, why are so many robot arms position controlled? It's actually fairly, um, you know, there's a fairly sophisticated argument behind it. I'll give you a light version of it. There's a slightly more dense version of it in the, in the notes if you care to read. But um, there's a couple big ideas that I think do affect the way we talk to our robots that I want you to make, to understand. <clears throat> All of the robots on this screen are uh, driven by electric motors, okay? I think that's true, yep. Uh, <clears throat> so the core thing that is sort of supplying power to our joints is an electric motor. An electric motor, you would think the standard model of an electric motor would be that there's some sort of simple relationship. If I put in some you know, current into the motor, it should be proportional to the torque at the joint, okay? Uh, similarly, the, the voltage you'd expect to be, you know, proportional to the speed of the joint. And these are fairly 
um, simple relationships. When you're in the sort of right spot in the torque speed curves, then these things actually are pretty good models of what, how, how are the motors we build today operate. Um, okay, so if we have this sort of nice proportional relationship, I mean, it's, they're often even just a, a linear relationship or affine relationship between current and torque. Then it seems kind of silly to say, well, most of these robots, most robots today aren't actually torque controlled because why? If I certainly I could just supply, you know, control the current I'm sending to the motor, right? Why can't I then control the torque of the motor? And the reason is that electric motors like to spin fast, thousands of RPMs, right? Uh, and robots, you probably don't want that guy moving at thousands of RPMs, right? Uh, <clears throat> and they don't like to produce a lot of torque, right? So, so actually, uh, it's very important to put a big transmission, a big gearbox, something that looks like this. You know, this is just a, a particular planetary gearbox, but we typically have between the motor and the actual joint that's moving a big gearbox, okay? Which we'll often just call the transmission. And that gearbox is meant to turn the super high revolution count in the, of the robot into a low revolution count on the joint and to amplify, similarly amplify the torques that you can um, so you can apply it. And the, <clears throat> it's very common on the robots that we, we see today to have this be uh, in excess of you know, 100 or even 1,000 to 1 uh, ratios, okay, the gear ratios. Now, that turns out to have a profound effect on the way that we think about the dynamics of our robot, okay? For, for a handful of reasons, I want to make sure I, I get it right. So um, I want to you know, call them out, highlight them carefully here. So the first thing is that um, it turns out that some of the gearbox dynamics are, are hard to model. Okay, why are they hard to model? Because if you think about what's happening inside there, there's a lot of friction of gears run, rubbing against each other. There's actually backlash. Do you know what backlash is, right? So you have teeth of our gears going like this. And when they're pushing in this direction, everything's good. They're applying a sort of a constant force. If you change directions, there's a momentary gap where they move and make contact with the other teeth, for instance, right? And if you don't model that, then you're going to get weird effects, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's, it, there's all kinds of things that happen inside that. There's flexing of the, of the gears and stuff like this, okay? In particular, friction backlash. Okay. But because of these, you know, there's already hard, difficult to model effects. And then this, the, the thing that happens is that you have a compounding uh, sort of importance of these effects because you take some of these dynamic features and you multiply them by some big numbers and suddenly they're a very significant part of your dynamics. Okay. There's another effect that goes along with having this big gear ratio, which is called reflected inertia. Okay, I'm gonna tell you what that means in a second here. And what these sort of all boil down to is that uh, it turns out that on these robots, position control Via, like, for instance, a PID controller, where this is a proportional integral derivative controller. These work really well. Okay. Um, in, in a strange way, the magnification of the gearbox actually makes PID control work better than you would expect if you didn't have the transmission or the, or the big, the, yeah, the big uh, gearbox. Okay, so I want you to understand that in a minute. 
these things combine. So PID, which is a very simple you know, position control idea in this sense, it um, becomes a dominant force in sort of controlling robots. And it takes a lot of work and cost, actually, to, to do better and add extra, um, you know, to actually achieve some sort of torque control. So most robots out there, if their goal is to do precise motions over and over again, are, are perfectly happy to, to stick with the stuff that works very well, which is these position control. OK, so let me just step through that in one level of detail, but not, not in its full glory. But let's just make that argument and, and make sure you understand those, some of those points. OK, so um, I say that transmissions are difficult to model. OK, gearboxes are hard to model. So what is the implication of that? Now, some of you today are, are um, you know, say, I know how to train a neural network to model anything. I'm not afraid of some hard to model gearbox. Uh, and I actually, I love that uh, because people are starting to make progress here where, where traditionally we've just said, don't try to model the gearbox. It's too hard. Some people are making progress in, ma in modeling these really hard things and, and we've seen some success there. And I, I actually think that can be great. Uh, so we, we might see a revolution in, in those kind of technologies. But classically, we've said those things are hard to model. Uh, don't even try. And so if you, if you don't try to model that, then, um, then your alternative is to add another sensor. So basically, if I'm, if I'm applying current and, and voltage at the so source of the motor, and I want to regulate the position, and I've got something difficult to model, what I need is a sensor on the other side of the difficult to model uh, event, right? Is that okay, you think, to see? I guess you'll know in two minutes or something. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the most common and easiest sensor to add after the motor is a position sensor. Back in the day, we, we had a lot of potentiometers. These days, they're mostly encoders. Okay. And then we can use feedback, a simple feedback rule. With this PID, that's what the PID is. To regulate the joint angle. Right? So I don't have a perfect model of the gearboxes, but I know some very, very basic properties. Like if I apply more torque, then I'll get, you know, I'll have a monotonic rela uh, you know, relationship between the torque I'm applying at the motor and the output, right? It's not that I'm going to, somehow it's going to suddenly go backwards or anything like that. So actually, it's enough to, to add a simple feedback uh, loop around it and do some basic control. Okay. <clears throat> What's interesting, though, is that, um, you know, there's, a, there's actually a, a science of trying to do control without the big motors. So um, there was a time where people were saying, this, this path we're going down with big gearboxes is, seems wrong-headed. Maybe we can actually just scale up our motors big enough that we can actually get very low gear ratios and avoid some of this and then achieve high bandwidth torque control. And actually, the, the leaders of that are, are, fa are on our faculty in mechanical engineering. That's Harry Asada and Kamal Yusuf Jumi. I don't know why I picked a picture of him with fish. But uh, I think that was, I think it was hard to find something different. But uh, he's a, you know, he doesn't always have fish. But he's uh, often found in building two, I guess. Um, and they wrote a book, it was actually Kamal's thesis, was about a book about uh, direct drive uh, robots, okay? And they're saying, keep your gear ratios under 10, for instance. And the reason is, and the analysis they did in that book, which I think is extremely important to understand, is that if, <clears throat> if I look at the equations of motion of my robot, and this is worked out in a little bit of detail in the, in the notes, then I get, when you see these equations, I want you to basically see F 
so m a equals a bunch of forces, okay? And instead of the um, instead of the mass, it's, he's writing J arm, which is the inertia inertia of the arm, which is a the mass like quantity. Theta double dot is his um, angular velocity. And he's relating that to the torques that come from gravity, friction, Coriolis terms, and stuff like this. Okay? And then Ni in this is the, um, is the gear ratio, the transmission ratio. I said, oh, you're right. Good Lord. So he wrote alpha double dot, okay, this is angular acceleration. I'm going to call it Q double dot everywhere, so let me use that here. Angular acceleration. Thank you for catching that. Okay, and Ni is the gear ratio. And the, the only important thing I want you to get here and, uh, is that the gear ratio pops into this equation in, in what I thought initially was a surprising way. Uh, it multiplies some of the terms in the equation by N squared. I would, I would have thought, okay, if I've got a 100 to 1 gear ratio, then I'm getting some terms in my equation that are scaled by 100. That's pretty bad, right? Turns out the scaling is actually on some of the terms is actually a, you know, squared of that, right? So, um, so dramatic change to the dynamics. In particular, so J rotor is the inertia of the motor. J arm is the inertia of the arm. And because the gear ratio affects the arm, but not the motor, even though if I'm looking at the robot and I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna, uh, you know, the dynamics of my robot are dominated by where the mass is on my arm, it's actually not like that. If you look at the dynamics of the robot, from the viewpoint of the, of the motor, the, the, all the stuff that's happening down at your arms is reduced by the squared of the, of the gear ratio. And the, the, just the inertia of your motor moving around is actually on par with the inertia of your arm moving around. Your motor is a simple thing that's sort of spinning around its axis. It's not changing dramatically depending on the configuration of the robot. So it has a, it has a big effect on the, the dynamics of the robot. It turns out, you know, when I go to pick things up, you'd think I would need very different control gains if I'm picking up something heavy or not. But a lot of these robots, if you have a big gear ratio, you can just use the same control gains everywhere because picking stuff up is actually kind of lost in some of the gear ratio. It, you know, squishes that out. And in fact, the dynamics look fairly constant over the workspace because the, the coordinate varying terms are getting squished out. Okay, even more, the, diag the dynamics end up being diagonalized. Okay, so you can almost think of controlling every joint independently, instead of all the couplings between the joints. Again, because the coupling terms relatively get get damped out. Okay, so it means yeah, please. No, you're good. That's great. No, no, it's good. I appreciate you calling me on it. Okay. So think of this, this schematic here. I've got a big motor. Right, well, this is actually a tiny motor. Okay. I've got a, the robot arm, tiny arm in this case. Okay. And then I've got a whole bunch of gears in between it. So I'm going to call this my motor, this my arm, and this my transmission in between. When the motor turns a thousand times or a hundred times, when I say the gear ratio is a hundred to one, that means that every hundred terms of the robot is going to only turn the arm once, fully, fully around. So that's my gear ratio. And what I'm saying is that, so that if you think about the physics of this system, there's some inertia in the arm. It's going to take some torque in order to start causing accelerations here at the, at the arm. Okay? It turns out that even if there's a lot of mass over here, it has a s relatively small effect because the gear, gearbox makes the, the effect it has on current at the motor small compared to just the magnets that are in here that have to move around. Those magnets have some inertia. Now you'd think if it's tucked inside my robot and I've got a big heavy robot arm and a little motor inside here, clearly the, the mass of the arm should dominate the motor, but not, it's not the case. It turns out that the, the small, relatively smaller magnets, even though it's a 
small percentage of the total mass of the robot, it actually has a, an inordinate effect on the dynamics of the robot when you have a big gear ratio. Thank you. And the, you know, the, the direct drive robot story was actually, let's see if we can build robots differently. Let's keep the gear ratio extremely small. And over the years, there's been a various ways to, to accomplish that. The first ones, actually, back in Kamal's thesis, were like, had enormous armatures. They had these big old motors uh, in order to get achieve direct drive, right? Um, people have done it with cable drives. There's a, um, there's a famous series of robots like the Barrett Wham, if you've heard the whole, the whole arm manipulator, um, that did, did, achieved it by having a very low distal mass. Okay, so if you keep your, the weight of your robot very low and you put your motors on the table and you run cables, then you can reduce the torque requirements and get away with relatively smaller motors. That's another way people have done it. And the, the, the reason this is actually coming back now in 2020 is that there's, there's more motors out there that, that are working extremely well. These outrunner motors, if anybody knows from, from hobbyists, the, you know, the, the UAV world has popularized outrunner motors where you, uh, it's a, just a different configuration of the, of the motors which are capable, or if they're happier producing higher torque for their mass, okay? And so you actually, we're starting to see some new robots being designed again that are trying to be closer to, to direct drive. But most of the research robots you see right now are in the very high gear ratio re regime. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I'll just repeat it uh, for the, so <clears throat> for the video. Um, yeah. So the question is, if that sounds great, you're igno you're taking all the complexity of the world, you're kind of driving it down to small, and the dynamics become easier. Why would you want to do anything else besides that, right? So your ability to control the forces on the on, uh, in the world then is also diminished, right? So if you want to do more sensitive, if you want to uh, con uh, control the forces you're applying uh, to the world or be more force sensitive or other things, that's where this starts becoming a problem. If you're just trying to, con to control positions, then it's a great thing to do, yeah? So when you want to hug Rod Brooks, uh, then, then you need to be a little different, I think. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is the blown out picture of one of the Iwa joints. Okay, so Iwa's taken a different approach and uh, there's a series of robots that do a similar thing, but I actually think that this robot uh, was one of the first ones that really changed people's mind about this approach being high performance and viable. It was originally done at the DLR, the uh, German Space Agency, and then KUKA turned it into a product, right? So <clears throat> they basically said, well, we can keep a big gearbox that keeps the uh, ergonomics of our motor uh, where we want them. But in addition to putting a position sensor on the joint, let's go ahead and put a torque sensor also on the joint. Now that seems like an obvious thing to do. Why wouldn't everybody do that? Well, torque sensing is a, is a bit of a black art and they did an extremely good job to make it work and make it packaged well. Okay, so um, the Iwa, Iwa is actually written all in lowercase. And it, it drives me nuts, but that's what that's how they'd write it, and I'll try to respect that. Um, okay, so uh, the Iwa still has a high gear ratio. But they've added both position and torque sensing at, at the joint side, or across the, across the transmission. So if they can measure the torque directly, then they can close a feedback loop on the torque and try to regulate the torque. Now, to do that, they had this beautiful design with strain gauges, okay? Strain gauges are, again are, you know, I think people have gotten better at it, but they're generally hard to do, to get high performance and hold calibration and all these things, okay? In order to do that, there's always, um, in, if you're trying to measure force, there's always going to be a trade-off in uh, 
deflection, how, how flexible your, your shaft is uh, versus how rigid, and your ability to, to measure torque. So uh, the, key, I, the key thing that happened on this robot is they were able to make, they call it a flexible spine, and they think of this as a flexible joint robot. They put a component in that, sh in that shaft, which is actually a, a stiff spring, okay? When I say stiff spring, I think it's like, I don't know, 5,000 Newton meters per radian or something like that. Okay? And they achieved performance in terms of position commands and other things that would be, that would make us, anybody who wanted to use it on a factory floor still happy, but they were able to, um, to still get torque control for people who wanted that. Okay? They did that not only with the beautiful design, but with some really good control, which we'll talk about later when we talk about uh, force control and the like. <clears throat> okay. Keep going down this spectrum. Um, there's a there's another type of robot out there, which is which actually Baxter is a, a a version of, which uses series elastic actuators. Okay, so I, you could call this a series elastic actuator, but we we typically don't because this is a, a very stiff spring, and we want to think of it as a flexible joint, but and you know admit that it's flexible, but mostly think of this as something that's capable of being a very uh, doing high bandwidth control. So if you needed to follow a very fast trajectory, you could. Um, if we're saying that we're in a different operating regime when we're operating around humans and we don't need a super, the ability to control very high frequency things, then you can maybe make the problem easier by having a soft spring, taking this down a huge range into a much softer spring. So, you know, these are more like 100 Newton meters per radian. Orders of magnitude softer, let's say, okay? And then, really just, you can even just use position sensors on both sides to measure the deflection of the spring and have a torque sensor, okay? This was the go-ahead idea in Series Elastic Actuator. And it, it, deserve, it owns a certain part of the design space. You wouldn't want to be doing, like I say, super high performance, super high bandwidth things with the Series Elastic Actuators. But I guess for, for hugging Rod Brooks, it was appropriate, right? Does that make sense? Any questions on just sort of the the, the high level architectures of the of these? Yeah. Because so you imagine this is a, this is a great question. Why wouldn't you want to? Why couldn't you do something maybe high performance? So um, from a linear systems perspective. Uh, you basically have a low-pass filter. The spring is going to look like a low-pass filter between your motor and the shaft. So if you were to try to do something very fast with your motor, it would be a, it would, you'd only see the decayed response at the output shaft because that spring exactly looks like a, you know, the first order looks like just a low-pass filter. And so you're, um, yeah, it, you do give up your ability to do bandwidth, to high, high bandwidth control. Yes? So you're saying it's not that it has a quality maximum torque necessarily. Correct. That's exactly right. The, to the maximum torque is not affected. It's, your, it's the rate at which you control that torque. Yeah. And um, so some people say series elastic actuators or any elasticity is almost, it makes the robot safer. But that's a little bit of a dangerous argument because you can actually store a lot of energy and you can't stop applying that energy very fast, right? So you might couple that with weaker motors and other things that, that, that keep you in a safety I think it's not enough. Uh, you don't make a safety case purely by saying I have series elastic. You need some extra requirements to be met. Good question. So <clears throat> once you have a robot that has torque sensing, then uh, you know they really made they did make a safety case this, with this. This is when it was at the DLR. That's Sammy Haddadin, and he was trying to um, to argue that the torque sensing on this robot is good enough that it becomes suddenly safe to be around humans. And, and the, it's, the torque sensing is good and the bandwidth is high. So if you were to sense, did that end already? Oh, here we go, okay. So he made an impact with this, uh, with this work by basically just starting to have the robot hit him at high speeds, okay? And showing that even if it somehow collides with him at high speeds, it can so quickly measure the torque, realize it's made at contact, 
and stop. Those things combined made it an effective safety case. If you go on, he starts hitting himself in the head, and then uh, if you look hard enough on the web, I think you can find something with the knife. Um, not, his, not his head, but uh, you know. And this was one of the first uh, arms to get certified by some industrial standards committees uh, in Europe in particular. Uh, this was the German project. Okay, and that's a really big deal if you want to be around humans. Uh, for me too, I, I care a lot about you know robots. Let me stop that so I can have your attention. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you think about trying to do delicate control, even if you're not manipulating a human, but you're manipulating uh, objects and you're trying to control the contact forces in order to crack an egg or other things like this. I, I have chosen Iwa in our lab and in, our, in the class here because it gives you the ability to do that potentially. Now that's a fairly expensive arm. That's like 80K or something for that arm. Um, the hands get add up too, okay? So it's not on the low cost side, but it's on a high performance side for what we want to do. The way you know, oh yeah, do you have a question? Right. I think that, that once you have that big transmission, the current is a very poor indicator of what's happening at the output shaft. You, so just because there's so, basically, if you write the equations of motion, you say I've got a, a motor torque and a current, uh, there's some terms in there that, are, that dominate because they get multiplied by the big number, and you just can't trust that relationship anymore. So the way you know, I mean, in addition to hitting yourself, the way you make a rock star uh, torque control robot demo is you, you convince people that you can pretend that your robot's not there, okay? So this is gravity compensation. Let me restart that a little. This is like on the KUKA website, right? Um, the standard thing you'll, you'll, you'll see when people are trying to show you they built a robot that's capable of accurate torque control is that they model the equations of motion of the arm and they try to cancel them out. So therefore, you can take this big, heavy robot, push it around as if it's not there. Okay, and if you can do that, it, it really is a fairly good test. I mean, for him to push it with a pinky or something like that, you know, there's a lot of transmission dynamics here that are being canceled out by the ability to sense torque and close that feedback loop. So that's very impressive. The earlier, the earlier arms that claimed to have torque control, you, it would have you know, been better than a rigid robot, but nowhere close to that. Uh, right, so, th so that was called gravity comp in, the, in their video, gra gravity compensation. But you can, in they're actually doing a little bit more than that. They're canceling out friction terms and other aspects too. Great. Um, I, I take more questions if you have them. Yeah. Yes. Good. So, so the question is, so, wh so uh, what is the difference between the stiff and the soft? So the soft, um, the IWA is an expensive, carefully engineered system that achieved high uh, accurate torque sensing with a, even though it had stiffness. You can get away with much cheaper designs, much less accurate designs, much cheaper sensors if your spring is soft because you just have to measure a large deflection. And so it's, it's, like it's just easier to measure torque. You may imagine if, you, if, you, if I apply a certain torque and my spring you know, only changes a hundredth of a degree, then I need a really accurate sensor. If I change the same amount of torque and it flexes like this, then it's a, a simple sensor to get the job done. Electric motors aren't the only game in town, although they're winning. They're definitely winning. Um, oops, I'll go out of order. But Atlas, for instance, is a torque-controlled robot, mostly. We actually use position control in the arms, but its legs were torque-controlled. But that was a hydraulic robot. This is the, uh, the earlier version, oh, actually even the new version of Atlas, okay? Uh, so they're, they're pumping fluid through the, through the valves, through valves, and they're measuring the pressure in the fluid. The differential pressure of the fluid across a valve is roughly proportional to the force that's being exerted. So that's another way to sort of get, achieve classically a torque control or force controlled robot is with hydraulics. Um, 
but electric motors are, are definitely, uh, even at Boston Dynamics, they, you know, the humanoid is still hydraulic, but the quadrupeds are now electric. And I wouldn't be surprised to see an you know, electric humanoid coming soon. Now, the ability to do that torque control, it's important if you want to hit yourself in the head. Um, it's also just important in practice for the type of robot manipulation we want to do. So an ex as an example of this, just if I remind you of this dish loading example, and this is particular, that one move right there. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we don't know accurately the position, size, everything of the dishwasher. In fact, every time we actually had a bunch of these robots doing the task, and every robot was in a little different, every dishwasher was in a little different place relative to the robot, right? Um, <clears throat> All we had to do was sort of get the, the robot sort of to, to get its hand around the, the handle. That wasn't too bad. But then as we're moving through the arc of the dishwasher, we're in a very compliant mode. We're using those torque sensors. We're, we're letting KUKA's low-level feedback controller put the robot in a relatively compliant mode. The joint angles are probably deviating from our planned trajectory quite a bit, but they're complying to the door, dishwasher door. And I, that's just very important, right? So it, there's a lot of tasks like that, that if you don't let, you know, if you, you can see robots that kind of get jammed, right? They're like, actually, if there's rigid on rigid, you know, <laughs> you know think bad things happen. Uh, and the ability to do this sort of soft thing and let the world go with the flow a little bit uh, is a big deal for, for making these things work. People are doing well with position control robots, too. I'm just singing the praises of, of, uh, of torque control. Okay. So let's think about, I, I just, you know, argued that the hardware is important, the way you, uh, actually even the way they write a controller around the hardware is important. So let's just connect that back to what you, you're doing on your problem set. You know, we have this manipulation station. You've been looking at the inputs and outputs, right? <clears throat> EWA takes in, uh, in this manipulation station system, right? Uh, there are input ports that take the position so if you want to send a position command, it will close a feedback loop around position. That's fine. It's capable of doing that, too. But the, uh, the extra feature is, is it has this optional feed-forward torque. Okay, so actually inside the, the system, inside the, 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 this big box here, they're, ru they're running their own low-level controller that is trying to regulate the gravity out, re regulate the friction, and they're allowing you to think about only the torques not required to move the robot. So this is the feed-forward torque. Uh, in addition, okay? And then you can measure position, velocity, torque, right? You have the torque commanded, torque measured, and ex some sense of external torque, so which is the difference between the torque they expected given their model of the robot. This is the torque that, that was required to move the robot, and these are the other torques that came from the world. So if I get measured some torque and I subtract out the robot's uh, dynamics, then you're getting the torque external forces, extra forces from the world. And you'll see that as you play with it. Um, more. Okay, but if we go to simulate this, let's just think about how you how do you actually simulate that. There's the first piece of simulating this, of course, is the physics engine. We need to have the equations of motion of the robot. Let's simulate first the EWA. Okay, and actually, if I want you to take one thing away from this, I put it on that title slide, and I'll put it up again at the end here. Um, is that simulating the EWA will require a physics engine, no doubt, but it's more than simulating the physics. It's somehow more than just simulating physics. Physics is the first step, but having a physics engine is not enough to simulate a robot of this complexity. Okay, you have to simulate the controllers, the sensors, all that other stuff in order to have a good simula faithful simulation. Okay, um, in practice, uh, in Drake, the physics engine is called the multi-body plant. This is doing the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, you know, including contact forces, it's, it's including uh, the, the friction and the, you know, these kind of things, okay? 
if I take the um, if I take a description of the robot and put it into multi-body plan, this is how I do it. Okay. Uh, in practice, all you have to do is you just say, you know, make a multi-body plant, add Iwa from file. There's a few different collision models we have. Sometimes you can have, uh, a lot of times we ignore the collision on the arm, but just put the collision on the hand. It just uh, keeps the modeling simpler. If we just add an Iwa into the physics engine and you say simulate, then guess what's going to happen? The Iwa's going to fall to, you know, into the abyss, right? So you need one more line, which is say, and by the way, why don't you weld it to the table, okay? And, or weld it to the world at the origin is what this is doing, and then go, okay? And what's happening behind the scenes there is that uh, somebody, KUKA, you know, provided a, a description file in the, one of the standard robot formats of the EWA dynamics. Typically, we've had, we, people have to clean them up, okay? But if you go in and dig in, or if you need a new robot or a new environment and you want to add to it, there are these description formats that, that you might have seen. Um, we, we handle SDF, URDF, Ujoko format are the three that we handle directly. Um, and it's just a simple description file. Actually, it's not as simple as it should be. XML is kind of gross. But uh, uh, it's a description format that allows you to, tell, to say what the mass is, what the inertia is what the geometry looks like. Importantly, you can set a different visual geometry from a collision geometry. Maybe you want the robot to look like one thing, but the physics you want to actually use, let's say, simpler geometry, so you don't have like some weird artifact in your mesh that causes you to get your arm caught on the table or something like that. Okay, and then you just list the links, links the jo list the joints. It's a pretty simple description format. Normally, the robot providers give those to you, uh, in practice, the robot providers often provide something, and then the community cleans it up a little bit, and you can find online something good. You, could, um, you know, beware if you find one online. Uh, a lot of times, they're pretty bad. Uh, I, I'm sort of shocked at how bad they are. Um, a lot of the, even the kinematics can be wrong, but but almost certainly the inertias are often wrong. In fact, Mujoko, if you load Mujoko is another simulator, um, by default, I think it ignores the inertia in the file and just recomputes its own because uh, that's certainly an option you can turn on. I think it's on by default uh, just because they don't trust. There's so many bad inertia files out there. You can you can write numbers into the sign distance, into the SDF, not, not sign distance, uh, scene description format, which don't, which are not possible for any physical system. Right? There, there, are, there are constraints on these that these numbers have to satisfy to be governed, you know, generated by physics and often they don't. Right, and sometimes you'll put a, a file in. So you know, Drake, for instance, will say, "You told this is a nonsensible inertia," and, and Mojoko would just be like, "I'll just ignore that and, and simulate a different one." They're different design philosophies, but um, you know, these these things, these files are out there. They're sometimes wrong. Okay, and then um, you know, we have a, the the other thing that you saw in your in your files, and you will be able to use in your projects and the like, is we just have a, a simple shorter YAML language that just says if you want to add a bunch of, if you want to add a, um, the robot with some bins, or for instance, and then you add a foam brick, we have just, you'll see this one extra little modeling language that makes it fast to, uh, to add lots of different models together into one simulation. Okay? Now, <clears throat> so multi-body plant is the physics engine. You also need a geometry engine, okay? It's called the scene graph in, in many gaming engines and in Drake also. It's called scene graph. This handles all of the, so this handles the masses, inertias, and kinematics, but this handles all the geometry queries. And if you want to, to talk to a renderer, uh, if you want to render a high quality picture, if you want to talk to the visualizer, if you want to compute collision geometries, that's the geometry engine that's, that's in scene graph, okay? They both manifest themselves as systems in your system diagram. So multi-body plant, the physics engine is just a system. It has a lot of mostly optional input and output ports. Okay. Scene graph is just a simpler system where it just pop, you can add in, uh, you should just 
make connections from other systems saying, I'm going to declare some geometry, I'm going to tell you its pose, and then you can ask questions about collisions, about um, rendering, and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting, actually, to think about why did we separate those two. Uh, you, could, you could maybe say all of those should go together in the same physics engine. But there's actually a lot of, a, of cases where you'd like to, let's say, have powerful sensor models and geometry rendering and stuff like that, but maybe use a different physics engine. For, or uh, like in the underactuated class, we often write our own simple dynamic equations. Or if you have an autonomous driving project, you probably want to use a very simple model of the car. You don't want to simulate tire mechanics, and a full physics model would be overkill. Um, so you know you can have one scene graph and multiple physics engines all feeding its the geometry into the single scene graph. Okay, so that's why there's two systems. If that seems weird. Okay, so you put those together, and you have a basic simulator. Okay, so let me just pull one up here. Okay, so if I just populate my um, my system with an EWA model, first of all, you remember what I said about the context? The context is just the state, the time, the input, whatever. What's the state of the physics engine? For EWA, which is a seven degree of freedom robot, you can see, you can just print out the state. It has 14 states. So for most physics engines, the state is going to be the positions and the velocities. Okay? And it has actually a bunch of parameters. Um, you, can, you can change the parameters and take gradients with respect to parameters and stuff like that. I'll just cruise through this. And if you simulate with just the multi-body plant, then you can see what the next, you know, you can see how the state evolves. The physics engine is complete in that sense, but there's no rendering yet because I haven't added the scene graph. If I want to visualize the scene, I'm just going to add um, the, I'm going to add two systems. I'm going to add the multi-body plant and the scene graph. And then I can call publish, and suddenly now I've got a rendering of the EWA in the visualizer. And then now if I simulate This is what happens, right? I can actually, I think I can play that back. No, I didn't save it. I can, and the next thing I say, oh yeah, here's, here's how you do an animation, okay. <clears throat> so you can save and record in the player and, and everything like this, okay? So this is what happens when you simulate just the physics of the EWA. That robot will never do this. <laughs> Thank God, <laughs> right? Um, so simulating the physics is not enough to simulate a robot of, these complex, of this complexity, right? This model is a model that says, give me your torque input, and currently the torque input is just set to zero because there's nothing else happening, okay? And then given that torque input, I'm gonna compute the equations of motion, figure out how the positions and velocities change, and then I'm gonna send them to the geometry engine. That's all we've done so far, but that's not enough, right? So in practice, what's happening is that we have a big old box down here that's running their controller that's doing something like gravity comp and friction comp, whatever. And we can add that to the, we need to add that to the system, add that EWA controller into the system, which is an ad additional bit of complexity. Like a lot of, um, a lot of simulators don't provide the, um, you know, the infrastructure to write all these controllers and everything too. Okay, you get a bigger, class diagram, now we have a PID controller, an inverse dynamics controller, um, and the like. Those are then connected to my multi-body plant and scene graph. Okay, but it's just a diagram. The dynamical systems language puts everything together. And now if I send the zero command to the, not to the, directly to the plant, but to the EWA controller module. Then the robot simulates like this, right? That's the zero command going into the EWA controller is now a, you know, much more like what happens on the real robot.
Okay. There are levels of fidelity which you can simulate all of the details of the controller. Like in fact, uh, someone asked on, on Piazza, there are actually mechanical brakes inside that. So uh, if you were to just have a, uh, you know, a motor trying to hold position uh, on an arm for a long time, that motor is going to heat up and bur burn out, right? So a lot of robots that are designed to be doing these kind of operations actually will, as soon as the robot stops, a brake will be engaged. We largely ignore that in the simulation of our robot. You could model that, but that's just, from my perspective, as soon as I send a command, it starts moving. There's something down in the details that, that lock and unlock that brake, but it's never influenced the motion of the robot from the, the level of detail I've looked at. If we needed to model it, we could. Okay. Uh, and even the way that we think about the detailed flexion in the joints, their controller, their low-level controller, cancels that out well enough that I typically ignore the flexible joint dynamics. If we really wanted to be moving it at the limits of the robot, we would add that in. Okay? Is that cool? So the manipulation station, this thing that has the input-output ports, is just the combination of those controllers, of the controller, the scene graph, and the dynamics, the three things that you're going to almost always use. Right? I'll have my multi-body plant, my scene graph, physics engine, geometry engine, my controller, which is implemented in a few pieces, right? And all I do is I put a diagram around this and provide the input ports that are at the level of abstraction that you would have, um, you know, that give you this level of abstraction, right? This is the thing you've seen and that you're probing on the problem set, okay? All that is is just making the diagram that does the details of the, of the robot uh, you know, expose some ports so that you have a new level of abstraction, you can just think of the manipulation station as one system that has all those details inside it. The cool thing is, of course, that I can take this system out of my code, put a, uh, a different system in that just talks directly to the robot, and the same inputs and outputs will just drive the robot around. We do have enough of these, we have a handful of these robots upstairs. Um, there was an early version, a prototype version of this course before COVID and before you guys uh, multiplied uh, uh, where we were going to have everything run on hardware. And I would say at the end of the, ye the year, if you've demonstrated sufficiently in simulation something and want to try it on the hardware, that sim to real gap is small enough that we could, we could consider doing that. Okay? So that's kind of the power of the modeling. I mean, that's just a, computer science is all about abstraction. In dynamical systems, the block diagrams are the way you accomplish that abstraction. Okay? Questions about that? Oh, good. I, I chicken scratched it because it's there's de the details are more important are, are on the slides um, or in the notes. I said e I wrote EWA position and EWA position measured, but that's actually one of many input ports and many out many more output ports actually. And even <clears throat> once you put a hand on the robot. There's going to be another detail. The controller for the hand is also going to be here. Okay, there's a few more little systems in here that provide that total abstraction. Okay, so let's talk about hands. The um, <clears throat> Oh, there you go. It's right there. That picture. Is the has the answer? I wrote the first, almost the first one on both sides. Okay, we talked about about arms. We talked about physics is only a subset of simulation, right? Let's talk about robot hands. And why did I pick this simple WSG? So, um, of course, when people think about robot hands, they think about this, right? They think about a dexterous hand. Um, always holding a light bulb or, a, or a something, you know, something fragile, an egg or something in the, in the glamour shots, okay? Um, 
Shit, this is the shadow hand. I don't have one of those here. I do have the Allegro hand in the middle there, uh, here. This one costs a lot more money. That's why I don't have it. Um, okay, this is the shadow hand is the one that was in this, um, you might have seen this famous OpenAI Rubik's Cube. Uh, well, this is the just the letters, and but then they did a Rubik's Cube after that. Uh, and it was, I think they were operating at the very limits of what that hand was capable of, and they spent a lot of time fixing the hand and working with the hand provider in order to make that endurance uh, testing happen. Okay? But there's an argument out there. Matt Mason used to make it, um, you know, maybe the most, most strongly, uh, but <clears throat> I think you could argue that a lot of the things we want to be done with manipulation in the home if I were to give you one of these things from the toy store and send you into my home, you'd be pretty useful, right? If you said, if I said you can only work, you know, operate in the world with this little two-finger gripper thing, um, you'd be way more useful than, <laughs> the, the, I mean, than Rubik's Cube twiddler, right? Um, so there's something to be said that I, I think uh, our, our robot hand technology will mature. It will enable great things, but I don't think we can say Robots aren't good at manipulation yet because of the hands. Right? I think if you put a powerful enough brain behind the hands, then we should be expecting more than we're seeing so far. And one of the best examples that sort of made that point, this was the PR1. This is actually, um, if some of you know the PR2 robot, this was an early prototype. Uh, and the robot went in and with simple two-finger grippers, little uh, claw hands, did all kinds of super useful things in the home. Right? It, uh, cleaned up the living room, there's another one where it gets a beer out of the fridge, it, you know, it mops, there's like incredible things that this thing did. What's the secret? Teleop. There was, that was all driven by somebody, you know, behind the scenes that were, that were moving the arms. But the hardware was capable, right? And they demonstrated that a long time ago, and that was, I think, that's just a really eye-opening that, that we can't blame the hardware. Simple hardware can do a lot of useful things. Okay, so in that sort of spirit, we've gone with a simple but high quality hand for most of the experiments. We can play with dexterous hands, and I put some in the notebooks if you wanna play with the Allegro hand or whatever. We're doing some research on, on more dexterous hands, but I think a lot of the manipulation problems that get towards intelligence can be studied avoiding the complexity of the hand and focusing on the complexity of the manipulation with a two-finger gripper. So this is the Shunk WSG-50. Uh, it's kind of the EWA class, you know, high, ex way too expensive, but high uh, quality sensing, torque control, it's force control now in the, uh, in the fingers, okay? I actually, I, I forgot to make, I only, I kind of made the point about the reflected inertia, but, um, but actually the Shunk gripper is an amazing example of, the, of reflected inertia. So I said, I said that the point, the reflected inertia is that the motor's inertia reflected through the joint looks bigger than it, than it should be because it's multiplied by the square of the gear ratio. Or similarly, the, ref, the inertia of the arm reflected back into the joint coordinates is much smaller by the square root of the inertia. Okay, and the, I think the EWA, or the, the WSG makes that point beautifully. So these are tiny little fingers. Maybe I can, no, I can't turn it. Uh, okay, these are tiny little fingers. They weigh very little in terms of mass. But if I push on them, they feel very inertial. What's happening there, right, is that there's a big gear, gear ratio inside here, and it's, there's a motor, and I'm doing most of my work to, ro to turn the, I'm sorry for you guys, in the, that was badly posed by me, but the fingers are moving slowly, and I'm pushing hard. That's what's <laughs> happening, uh, right? And it feels like there's a large mass, okay? And that is the effect of the reflected inertia. In fact, um, we actually don't simulate that super well in the first notebooks uh, that I released, and I'm embarrassed because uh, there's, a, there's a newer version of the, of the Dynamics engine that I could turn on and it would simulate that reflected inertia beautifully. But right now, if you notice in the Teleop demo, how many people actually ran the Teleop demo in the first notebook? Okay, everybody else run it. I worked really hard on, on that. Um, but if you go down, you can like, you'll get in a situation where the, the fingers look kind of like wiggly and loose. And this, these fingers will never look wiggly and loose, right? And the difference is, it's actually the dynamics of that simulation are dominated by my light little fingers, okay? I have to choose a small time step 
I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty reasonable. But the, the size of the time step I choose to simulate the dynamics is dominated because of the light mass that we're simulating in the fingers. And if I, in fact, if I in fact add that reflected inertia, then they feel much more massive, and I can take bigger time steps, and I can simulate faster. Speed wasn't an issue for those little simulations, but that that dominates, right? It's actually it re reminds me of a story. So, when we were doing the DARPA challenge, the first part of the DARPA challenge was actually running our code on somebody else's simulator in the cloud, right? And <clears throat> we were working super hard on these balancing control and. You know, part of the game, if you get to know me, the, the part of my game is to try to understand the mechanics, understand the structure of the mechanics, how do I write better optimizations that exploit the structure of the mechanics, okay? We worked really hard. We did fairly well in the competition, right? But we, I heard a talk from the guys that wrote the simulator later after the competition. <laughs> and they were like, oh, you know, we realized somewhere in the middle that uh, it's pretty hard to have a heavy robot in light fingers. So. We just realized you could take some of the mass from here and throw it in the fingers, right? And I was like, I'm a pretty chill guy, right? But I was like, all the blood's running to the, you know. I was like, what did you do to my beautiful dynamics? That's not, that's not what, how you should simulate it. Um, so simulators do weird things to, to make it happen, but physically, the right way to model that is as a reflected inertia. Because if you add mass to the fingers, that if I lift, it's actually, I mean, I, 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 shouldn't, I should only feel the mass of the motor and the mass of the fingers when I lift, right? But when I push, I should feel the force of the, uh, the extra inertia of the motor. So you can't just add mass and get the same effect. It's wrong, right? Okay, but there are, you know, these beautiful hands out there. There's a, I brought a series of them here. Uh, one, one of them is the Sandia hand. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, big sort of dexterous hand there. It's got some cameras in its fingers. That was a pretty fun hand to work with. Um, this is the I high. This is one of the first underactuated, uh, not one of the first, but one of the um, most successful, I think, early uh, underactuated hands. It's actually, if you people know right hand robotics, the people that's a startup, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a mature startup at this point that's uh, in town, and they were the original designers of this hand, created a company called Right Hand Robotics, and they're doing logistics and have a newer, much better version of that hand now. This is the Robotique three-fingered gripper. It's actually an incredibly clever hand. Um, it's got these four-bar linkages. It's hard to see, but you can come down and see it afterwards. So if you just squeeze, uh, it has less degrees of freedom than joints, but it has four-bar linkages so that when you collapse on an, ob on an object, it will close, but it'll, clo it'll adapt its geometry to the, to the hand, to the object, right? And uh, this, this one, too, this one does it with tendons. This one does it with rigid links, right? And there's a great, a, a great series of hands out there. I, I put uh, descriptions of them in the notes. This one is maybe uh, out of the box, one of the cooler ones, so uh, <clears throat> of an unconventional gripper. I don't know why it started in the middle here, but uh, okay, that's, that's what people used to do, I guess. Okay, now they have a, just a a bag, a balloon full of coffee grounds. And the idea is that when you suck on the coffee grounds, it goes through a phase transition. The thing is very compliant and, conf and conformant when it's loose. When you suck, the granular media jams and it holds position. And they can use that to basically pick up anything with this like bag of coffee grounds, right? And that's one of a million sort of, uh, not a million, but a handful of really, see there's always an egg. Um, <laughs> A really, really cool hands that are out there. Yeah, that was not good, I guess. And then you'll see, um, you know, more and more soft hands. I've, I've tried. There's, I think, the soft hands are moving towards the place where they can be more and more dexterous. So this was uh, a play on the OpenAI demo, but now with a hand that's just balloon actuated effectively, right? These is, um, you know, soft materials where the actuators are just. Uh, you know, blow, you know, expanding and contracting the air inside the um, inside the fingers. And who knows? I mean, I would have said before that soft hands are awesome, but they aren't dexterous enough to like button my shirt. Right? It'd be good for picking up an egg, but not for buttoning my shirt. And people are trying to challenge that. Um, we'll talk. We'll have a session later about uh, tactile sensors. I sort of haven't talked much about sensing in the hardware thing today. We'll talk about cameras and tactile sensing 
uh, later, but one of the big trends in tactile sensing is actually sensing with a camera that's behind your skin and trying to use, they call it visual tactile sensing. And we'll talk about what's good and bad about that uh, when the time comes. Okay, the other thing that um, you know, we won't spend, we can, you can certainly simulate these for your projects. I, ha I, haven't, I, I, haven't, I won't put emphasis on the mobile manipulator case, but um, it's an extremely important part of manipulation. And sometimes I feel bad about it because um, I think some problems are artificially hard on a robot with a rigid base. Uh, Tomas Lozano Perez likes to tease me because um, you know you can easily r run into failures of the kinematics. Like the kinematic problem is, is like solving a puzzle when you're a rigid robot with exactly seven links, or even worse if you have six, six links and you're trying to manipulate something on the table or reach into the sink, kitchen sink. Right? That gets pretty hard. And if you just put a mobile base, then like there's so many more solutions to the, to the kinematics problems. Um, and he just thinks I'm working too hard for, on the wrong problem. Uh, but the, on the flip side, once you can drive around, then um, you know you can get into all kinds of trouble, uh, right? So uh, this is the PR2, the second version of the one that made the uh, examples and got a beer out of the fridge. This is the Fetch robot. This is the Toyota's HSR. This is the Everyday robot. Right? I think um, so. Leslie and Tomas, I think, haven't truly been happy since the PR2 died. Uh, they, they've never found a, a complete replacement. Uh, this was a really good robot that enabled a lot of research in a lot of labs. But we, but it's extinct now and pretty much, I think the last, every part, every spare part that could be purchased on uh, online has been purchased on eBay. So I think it's pretty much dead. You, you broke a PR2? Don't brag about that. <laughs> it was like you just killed a species, right? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, they were really good robots. Um, and then this is the video that I failed to show you last time. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, like one, I, it's an amazing uh, mobile manipulator um, that was, my slide was hidden last time and I only showed you the failures. But it actually successfully, most of the time, takes your orders and drives through the grocery store and, uh, and it completes the orders with uh, combining all the perception but also you know, a very useful, adding the mobile base obviously made this task possible. All right, any high level question? I'm going to end with like my favorite robot videos of all times. <laughs> but before I do that, is there any other questions about what we've been talking about? Yes? Question about the depth of the simulation. Yeah? We're, we're saying we can't call it a computer box. So what are we simulating? Basically, we're not simulating the engine and the gearbox. Great question. So, so if I say I can't simulate the gearbox, but I say that there's some depth in the simulation, then where is that happening? So I'm relying, I'm modeling that the closed loop dynamics of the low level feedback controller, which is measuring the sensor and, and on, on either side of the transmission, is provide, that's providing a contract to me that I can, I, that I'm, that's what I'm modeling is the contract, saying that the, the closed loop performance of the feedback controller around that messy gearbox makes it look like I control, control torque. But I also model the gravity, the, the things that, so torque is not enough. The, their low level controller tries to compensate for friction, tries to compensate for the inert, the gravity. So that's the model that we're simulating of their controller. But we're not getting in there on the, the messiness of the gears because it's hard to model. So we're understanding the absolute torque, the gravity effect, friction, all of that is being modeled. Yep. Correct. Gravity, friction. At, you know, and uh, contact forces are a big one. But, but I think that the, the thing that makes simulating manipulation hard, much harder than previous you know, wheeled robots or, or legged robots is the, again, it's the, what I said about the light fingers, it's even, you know, if I can pick up sort of anything, I have a heavy robot and I, have, I can pick up light objects and provide contact forces that can change very fast with small changes in geometry, this is what makes the numerics of simulation very hard. So most of the effort in manipulation simulation in the physics engine is about simulating the contact accurately. Great. Okay. Favorite robot of all time? Pretty, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's like asking me to choose among my children, but um, um, this is really awesome. So this is a um, Ishikawa lab in, <laughs> in Japan. They, um, they basically took their electric motors 
and took off all the safeties and probably burned them, um, I would guess, but they overclocked their motors in order to make a series of just jaw-dropping high-speed video demos. This is, look at the footage. This is a long time ago, right? So they did very high-speed tracking first for vision, and then they did, uh, you know, high-speed motions of their robot. And they completely, in my mind, changed what was possible in terms of manipulation in a narrow sense. I don't think this is going to, like, be successful every time, but you, you got to see what it does. Okay, here's dribbling. <laughs> this is high speed slowed down. I mean, this is like in the early 2000s. I think it's flipping me off. Yeah. <laughs> Pen spinning. Right? So there are some good hardware out there. You can throw and catch. But let me just get to the, my favorite one. Here we go. All right. This is a cell phone. <laughs> right? What? That is so good, right? I, I met the people that worked on that, and I was like, I saw how many times did that work? It's like, it for, it don't like once, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't matter to me. Um, okay, and by the way, you know, OpenAI was so, got so much press in 2019 for their Rubik's Cube, but this was 2017, right? And uh, these guys were doing Rubik's Cubes way faster, you know. It's almost not fair that nobody knows about this one, you know? Anyhow. All right, cool. So if anybody wants to come down and see the robots, um, you know, check it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you won't be able to, oh, that, the fingers for sure, yeah. Yeah, go for it, yeah. So this one's tendon driven? No, this one is actually oh. the four bar linkage. Oh, okay. And this one's tendons. Okay, so this one's the you tendons. can see the tendons. Okay. They're fragile, right? So, uh, I mean, we've, we've broken with things in the hand and, and they're like, this is rock solid. We dropped our humanoid on that a few times and it was still fine. We're gonna. I'm gonna bring it down for proper demos later, but oh, okay. but right now it's just a statue. Got it. For silly reasons, we uh, we brought the wrong pendant. <laughs> oh, that's that's why we couldn't demo it today. Well, I wasn't. I was just planning to mostly po pose it, but um, I was gonna put it in a slightly more elegant position than that. I see. I see. How much are like one of these hands? Yeah, they can be exp pretty expensive. They're different. Even the shunk, which is the simple one in some sense, it's the high end simple one. It's 15k. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. One of these would be like even more than that. Yeah. Uh, the Allegro. So, so this would be a, a pretty expensive one. This is designed to be a low-cost, dexterous hand. So it's actually using Dynamixel, which are those like hobby servos. Mm -hmm. It's a high-end hobby servos. I see. But uh, its appeal is that it's low cost. Right, uh, the direct drive means that you have to have a very big motor, so it gets very, very heavy. Yep, it's just a matter of keeping your robot light and the cost down uh, and fitting it in the packaging. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah? What makes the hard linkages in advance and beyond the, ten the tendon uh, linkages for the 
tendons are notorious.